What's up? This is Matt with Let's Talk Music. I'm here with Hammy from Heavy Petting, and uh, Hammy is joining us from Florida today. And he says it's uh, right next to the ocean. Yes, it is right out my door. <laughs> Lucky fella. So all of us people, you know, that are in Ohio and everywhere else, we just get to be jealous. <laughs> well, Ohio's got its good points as well. Oh yeah, yeah. Ohio's a it's a good music town, man. Well, good. Columbus is a good music town. Dayton's yeah. pretty good. Cleveland, you know, Cincinnati. We we got we got you know quite a good performers through here. So, Can't awesome. complain. So, uh, tell me about Heavy Petting, man. What's been going on? Uh, seeing you guys well, uh, dominated at uh, Rock Festival in twenty twenty two. Yeah, yeah, that was that that was that was awesome. That took a little bit of hard work. We obviously we we split up. Uh, at the middle of mid nineties after doing everything tour and all the eighties and doing all our albums and stuff. And we finally get back together in 2016. And, uh, and that was me making a phone call to everybody saying, Hey, you know, let, let's, cause we get, we used to get asked every year, especially for the Japanese and the Europeans, you know, let's put the band back together. And we never would because one of us always didn't want to do it. Right. So we finally agreed. And, uh, so it took a lot of hard work. Oh, a lot of, we started. Uh, we did. We started touring again in like 2018 uh, in Europe. See how it just to get our feet wet, and we did that. And then we played some shows uh, out with outside of Europe. Came to America for a little bit to test some stuff. Did the Monsters of Rock mm -hmm. cruise thing, which was awesome. Then we're back and toured again in Europe. So uh, last year was awesome. So all that kind of hard work paid off. To where we could headline some of the, the other the bigger festivals, and uh, the one in Spain was awesome. Legends of Rock was was way cool, and uh, we had a great time. And the place was packed, and we went over great. So we were really excited. So we're looking forward to uh, now coming out two twenty three. Getting we've got the fortieth anniversary coming out for the first album, mm -hmm. and we're going to release a new album towards the end of the year. Like maybe like October or something like that. So, uh, so we're looking forward to going back out. We speak go back out and tour in uh, August. So we played, I think the first gigs in Munich actually, August twenty sixth. Oh we wow! Play, we play uh, one of the big festivals in in Germany. So, yeah. So that's the time. Then it all starts rolling again, and hopefully, uh, now that we've got new management with uh, with Sean, Sean Barouche at a uh, music uh, gallery international. Uh, we'll be in America in 24. So we're highly excited about it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I uh, <clears throat> actually, I want to say uh, last week or the week before, I talked to your old drummer, Gary. Oh, you're kidding me. Yeah, he, <laughs> he's got a new band called Burnout Wreck. And uh, yeah. I, I did an interview with him and nice guy. How did that go? It went good. Did, it, did you understand him okay? Oh, yeah, yeah. I Man, I, I have done... I have to have like fine tuned hearing. I've done bands that, you know, from Finland, Ireland. Um, I, I think I've done, I, I got one coming up from Romania oh, so, cool. and Russia. Yeah. Well, the guy's a little worried because he says, you know, his English ain't the greatest. And I'm like, Hey man, you know, we're talking music. We, it, we speak a, <laughs> a similar language, you know? Yeah. So, but yeah, it was, it was a cool conversation. I mean, you know, what's he up to? He's got a new Gary's got a new album coming out, right? Yeah, yeah. It's um a band called Burnout Wreck. Uh he's his newest single is called Stand and Fight. And I, I told him, I said, Man, I said when I first heard it, I swear to God, you was Bon Scott reincarnated. Yeah, A C D C. That's what it is. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He's always sounded like that. He's always had that great kind of voice that uh because anywhere we used to go out back in the day and There'd be bands playing. Gary would always go up and sing "Hi, where the hell?" Oh. <laughs> that was his. That was his go-to, you know. But uh, yeah, he's got a great rock. Yeah, Gary's got a great rock voice, man. He's. But it does sound. I've told him this, but it, it does sound kind of 
I, the, the first two albums that I heard were kind of like Power Age from the ACDC yeah. era on. But, but hell, man, he, he's doing great. He digs it. So good luck to him. Yeah, I mean, and he was he was filling me in on some of your stories, man. You guys, you know, out touring with Motley Crue back in the eighties on the what was it, the uh Cat of the Devil? Yeah. Yeah, the Devil Tour. Yeah. Yeah, man. that was crazy. That was a long, that was a long ass time. We did the uh, Yeah, in the space of like three years from like 82, 83, 84, 85, with the first album and the second album. I mean, we just toured the world with Kiss, Ozzy. Ozzy Osbourne, we did the whole Bark at the Moon tour mm. and then did some of the shows in America and then left and went on with Motley Crue to do the Shout at the Devil tour. And then we went out with Rat, did the At, at, at the Sailor tour with those dudes. And then uh, White Snake after that and back in Europe and everywhere. So we were really spoiled for the first like, four or five years of playing. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, that's cool. That, that, that was uh, definitely some. Um... Well, it was the '80s, so you know the the decade yeah. of success. Yeah, yeah, it was the yeah the the era of excess and completely out of control. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it. it I, I I'll tell you, I, I my I was born in you know late '70s, and I, I I lived through the '80s, but I was a kid. But in the '90s, it was it was quite excessive then too. I mean, oh, I can imagine. Yeah. You had you had all the bands like Poison and Warrant and all them, you know, and all they're, they're pushing sex, drugs, and rock and roll just as hard as the eighties, and yeah, probably sex even harder. So you know, it was yeah, it was it was some good times, man. But well, people I met, I mean, different bands I met when we were touring in the eighties. When we first came to America, we met a whole different bunch of bands that uh, some of the foreigner dudes and. Obviously, Journey and all those guys that were all playing in the seventies and up, and some other people that we met that were in big bands in the seventies. They used to tell us some of the stories from those days, and uh, that was just sounded crazy. <laughs> you know. So was you? Uh, was you playing music when you was in Scotland? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were. Uh, we started. We get together. Yeah, we played in. It's a little bit different in Scotland. Whereas when you come in, when you play in America and you're a bar band in America. It's like you play for shit, man. You play any band I've got to see plays like five hour sets or some shit like that. You know what I mean? They play like forever. Start mm. at eight o'clock at night and finish like two, three in the morning, whatever. And in Britain, it was totally different uh, growing up. We had, uh, you would start like at eight o'clock or maybe nine or something. You played like two 45 minute sets and that was it. And that's all you did. So you play all these pubs and you just played for like two 45 minutes sets. So that's what we all did. And then eventually we started gearing ourselves because we all knew each other from school. So then uh, I was singing in one band and then they heard I'd left that band and Gordon and Gary get in touch with me and said, hey, uh, you want to come sing for us? And I was like, okay, sure, I'm not doing it. So let's, let's get together and jam. And we did and we all hit it off. And, uh, and that was like 1980. And after that, then we just, we, we really, we were one of the few bands that concentrated on writing our own material mm -hmm. instead of just out playing everybody else's. Right. And so we would throw our own songs into the sets, the two 45 minute sets kind of thing. And then we started doing shows where we would only play for like an hour and a half. So we would tell everybody, now we're going to start at this time and that's when we're going to finish. We ain't splitting it up. Right. We're going to put it like a show. And, uh, and so a lot of the promoters get pissed and the bars get pissed. But once we started getting a name and bringing place, people started lining up outside to come and see us, then they let us do basically what we wanted. So we were one of the first bands to do all that. And uh, then eventually, you know, we we changed the, the band. It was so bad, man. The band originally was called Weeper, <laughs> which was which was terrible. And uh, But then I changed the name to Heavy Pen. And then, like I said, we started writing stuff and then we started leaving Scotland and going to England and going to London because none of the record labels would come up to Scotland because mm -hmm. they were all kind of scared. In those days, they were scared to travel up there and hang out and nobody wanted to come. So uh, so we, uh, we, we got a bus, we got an old school bus, put it together and then uh, started heading out and playing south all the time. And then going to London and knocking on the record label doors and stuff, and 
finally we wore everybody down after about a year of playing down there constantly and uh, ended up signing to Warner Brothers first and then Polygram. So so it worked, it worked out for us. A lot of people tried to copy that after us, but uh, it never really worked for them, but it worked for us. So we were kind of, we were real lucky. So, so in all the years that you guys have been out on tour with, you know, big bands and, and doing your thing and whatever, what, what, who, who is the band that you really connected the most with that you toured with? Oh, I think we connected with a lot of different people in different ways. <clears throat> Obviously for, to, for becoming fast friends and out of control straight away was, well, that's what I would say. Uh, Motley Crue was definitely the crew. Because it was lit from the minute we arrived. And I forget where the first gig it was we played. I think it was somewhere in California. But because uh, we were coming from Texas, because we just finished uh, a co headline tour we Accept. So uh, Accept and us were touring, doing that. And uh, we got offered that gig. And we'd already played a couple of shows with him on the Ozzy Osbourne thing. So we kind of, we never knew each other, but we did. But so as soon as, we get told that we were up for the the shot at the devil tour. It was like, man, it was awesome. So from the minute we arrived and we're in a dressing room, Tommy just came in, man, and just kicked the door in and the dressing room started shouting, Hey me, Hey me. And then I'm like, what? We were all panicking and I'm like, what, what is it? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, shit. And we were all hugging each other. And from that moment on, it was just chaos, you know? So it was good. So I would say we, we all, that was the, as a group on group, that was the one where we all kind of gelled together. Now, some of the other tours, like, you know, when we toured with Whitesnake, obviously I was a huge Coverdale fan. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I always made a point of hanging out and talking to him and stuff and, you know, learning about his voice and how he did, which never really worked because in those days he was smoking like Marlboro Reds. So he was like constantly smoking all the time, you know, and I'm and I'm trying to go, well, how'd you keep your voice in shape when you're touring and shit, you know? And the twos would just end up drunk, you know, and he's like chain smoking. I was like, well, hell, that ain't going to work. But uh, right. so individually, we all kind of went to other different people with different acts that we played with. And uh, but like Ozzy, when we toured with Ozzy was uh, was really crazy. That, that was that was really uh, off the wall, man. That was wild. But uh, I think most of the time, Ozzy was, he would go away. So we were left with the rest of the guys in the band. Right. And so at that time, so we all kind of connected with Jakey Lee and uh, Bob Daisley on bass and all that stuff. And actually one of my drum heroes in those days, I used to love Carmine Apathy. And when we did the first, uh, all of a sudden, uh, Carmine appeared and he was playing drums. You know, and we were like, well, where the hell, where the hell's Tommy Aldridge? You know what I mean? And but right. so I was a big fan of Carmine, so that was cool for me. So we would hang out and talk and all that shit. And then when we came to America, uh, Carmine was fired and Tommy was back in. So <laughs> it was like, it was it was kind of wild. So yeah, I could imagine, man. I mean, I, I've I've read the stories, watched the documentaries, and everything on them guys, and it they're lucky they're still here. Um, oh yeah, yeah, hard definitely. Hard. I think anybody that's uh, that went through that whole time, especially if you were in a rock band, and and you don't have to be in a big rock band because everybody was in excess and out of control. But when you were in a big rock band or touring with a big rock band and all that stuff, and mm. it was like months and months and months and months and months. Man, it was it was insane. It was an insane lifestyle. Oh, I bet. But it was great. I mean, it was fantastic. I think the reason we all survived is because we were so young. Yeah. You know, because you could you could recover quickly, you know. And I also think these days that uh we couldn't get away with the stuff that we did in those days, you could never get away with that now. No. You know, and every shape, you know, every shape and form, you could never get away with that. So it was good they never had the Facebook or any of that stuff or mobile for those kind of phones facebook yeah. they do facetime and shit so yeah yeah i i agree with that um you know just me just being um uh, kind of 
I guess, live in that lifestyle vicariously, you know, um, you know, I, I always said that a party like a rock star, but just didn't get paid like one or, you know, whatever. So, <laughs> uh, I know exactly what you're talking about. If, if Facebook and stuff was around back then, I would be probably mortified. So, oh yeah. But now as, as a headliner, you know, when you guys go out and headline and you, you take a band out with you, um, do you look for a certain criteria or you just say, Hey, I like the way these guys sound, you know, come I with think that's basically, yeah. I think people come to us and, uh, and if nobody's really pushing anything, it's like well, whoever we hear and we, we think they're really good then. And if we get along with them, you know, cause sometimes somebody will meet one of them or sort of meet them and go, I know, I know that dude, man, he's cool. So, uh, just like it was with us when we would try and get to those other, those other bands, but then, Obviously, the record label were paying; yeah, they were buying us on to some of those mm -hmm. tours. But even even still, it was like you still had to get along with the the guys that you were playing with, the headliners, right. or else they would just kick you off. You know, if you're a bunch of assholes. But uh, yeah, we kind of look for bands that are that are people that we're going to enjoy spending a bunch of time with, because obviously you're out there for a while. So, right. So that's really basically it. So it's you said. You, you mentioned that you're getting ready to uh, head out to Europe and all. Yeah. yeah. Are you guys, are you, are you still currently label backed or are you guys independent? Well, at the moment we're independent, but that's going to change. So, uh, cause Sean's been working with a couple of different labels and we've been finishing off all the demos for the new album. Okay. And so that's what I'm going to be doing. We're going to finish off the new album before like I'll likely go to, I'll fly out to London and go sing the album in like April mm -hmm. and then get all that finished because rehearsals start in the beginning of August. So that gives us time between now and then for Sean to do what he's doing. And we've got like three labels that are sitting there right now. So that are, that have been listening to the new stuff and they're really liking them. So it's just, so we'll just kind of wait and see which what one Sean's going to talk to us about that pulling the trigger on. So are, are they UK la labels or? Uh, well, a couple are European. One's, one's from Italy. Uh, one's one of the biggest labels in Italy. Uh, and then you've got, we've got a couple in America. And then there is one for the UK, but I don't know if we're, I don't know if that's high on our list of wanting to do that. So, uh, but that could change. You never know at the end of the day, at the end of the day. But at the moment we're concentrating. We'd, we'd really like to, because I guess these days, as you know, the music business has changed. Oh, so yeah. so you have to get that right label that is willing to put the time and the effort and the money in, in making sure, not so much with the the albums, because we can, we can deliver that. We can deliver the product and deliver, get it produced and all that kind of stuff. But everything else, it goes with it. You know, we need them to promote it and do the, doing the videos and then putting money up for touring and stuff. So, uh, so obviously that's the kind of labels that we're, we're looking at and there's only, and those labels are few and far between now. Yeah. So, Cause everybody really just wants you to show up with a great album, give it to them and they'll distribute it for you, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, so we want to get like a little bit old school and, and get it that way where the record label is get as much involved in it as we do, you know? Right. So being, old school, old school musician. Um, how do you feel about the music business these days with it being, um, you know, your videos are on YouTube and not really on the TV anymore, like MTV or, yeah. you know, not having the physical copy unless you, that's what you want to do. But, you know, yeah. most people are doing the streaming. How, how does that, I that? You know, I think that's kind of, I, I preferred it the old way. Let's let's put it that way. But I know it's like you have to use other socials and do everything that you need to do to get your stuff out there, and uh, and that's why we've hired some really good people to take care of that now. But uh, I I would have preferred it the old way, where you know you did have like a major uh, label that was behind you and pushing you for everything, and then you get to something like MTV that was there because MTV was awesome in the day. Oh yeah, you know what I mean? Because it's like, because I'm sure, like, if you were uh, old enough in Ohio in that time, seeing 
the bands that were coming out of LA in the eighties and you were living in Ohio and other places where the bands never got to yet, you'd be sitting there going, damn man, can't wait to see those dudes. Right. You know? So it was like, so it was a great medium to get everything out there. And especially when everything, your song would go in high rotation. And uh, so I, I wish they had something like that these days. It was just as big, but obviously there's other things in different countries, but it's, I think it's good. I don't really, the streaming thing, it's, it's a shame that most bands don't make as, uh, it's hard to make as much money as you used to do. Right. You know, so that's why it's a big deal for people to like bands on Facebook or your Instagrams and, and go see them play live and buy their merchandise. Cause that's mm-hmm. what keeps all the bands going, you right. know, and in, in America, it's a little bit different where, uh, COVID, I mean, COVID hit everybody. I mean, the music business was bad anyway, but co- when COVID came and th- that just totally destroyed the playing field, man, that just mm-hmm. kind of leveled everything totally out. Oh and, yeah. It destroyed a lot of venues, destroyed a lot. Oh, of- hell yeah. Yeah. People's lives and, and, uh, you know, and, but America's coming back. You can, uh, you can still play big clubs. You don't have to be this. Look, it's great for the bigger bands because they can go play the big venues and that's great. And then you've got medium places. Then you've got big, big clubs where you can get about 1,500 people. And then you've got small bars. So all that's still going basically in America. But uh, and f- kind of in Europe, uh, Europe has festivals, which are great. Right. Uh, they, I mean, they've got festivals everywhere. So that's a real, that's a really great tool to go promote your band is playing all the, all the festivals. Uh, but some of the countries have great venues to go play. You don't have to be this big band. You can go play for 1,500, 2,000 people in a big club. But the UK, uh, I mean, that's screwed. That is totally shafted, man. It's like there's nothing medium size. You get small pubs where you can go in and play or else you get the big venues. Right. So And and it's hard for the, the middle-sized places to take a chance on bands and and now what they're doing, which is a good deal for the punters, is because uh, we've been going through this, is like now you bring along three or four, there's like instead of just you and, a, and, and another band, like your special guest opening up for you, there's like two or three bands that that are good. Yeah. You know, I mean they could be headlining that thing in the same time in their own in their own right. Right. But you go out and you put a package together and you go play. And you get more of those places to play and more people come and fill it up. But yeah. so but but Britain's a lot harder. They've 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 kind of I don't know if it'll ever come back there, but hopefully it will one day, but I don't know. Well, we're actually starting to get there now. Um uh, you know, with the festivals, there's oh, I'd say probably about 15 or so the 15 maybe 20 that go through the united states i mean i know it's not like i used to see the videos on on mtv um where you know they would show uh well live aid for instance or you know you would see just this huge festival over in europe and you're like man look at that sea of people you know and you never seen that here and it was like uh one of the bands that um i either just did an interview with or a press release that i got they're getting ready to play Whacking Open Air, which I know is a huge one. Oh, Whacking's out of control. Yeah. Whacking is awesome. So, I mean, it's anymore. That's that's the thing to be on is uh, those festivals, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely. It's but I mean, it's still to to me, I, I mean, I love going to, the you know, the three, four day festival. I mean, it's hard on me anymore. You know, it's it's. It, <laughs> you know three or four days out in the, in the elements of the weather and bouncing around with people and drinking and whatever else but you know it's it's a blast but i mean a, i think a lot of times man i just i enjoy those smaller venues you know the the five six hundred people you know or yeah. whatever um you know we got quite a few good ones here in, in columbus we've got you know the king of clubs we've got the newport music hall express life i mean you know they're all just decent sized venues and they get they get a lot of you know national acts in there they get a lot of big bands and it's it's just really i think it's more personal you know what i mean yeah no i get it yeah you're not in a sea of people and 
one of the things that I hated about one of the festivals that I went to a couple of times was you get up close and you're like, oh, hell yeah, man, I'm as close as I want to be jamming to the band and stuff. And you got to constantly do this because people are crowd surfing. You got to watch, make sure you ain't yeah. getting kicked in the back of the head. <laughs> you, know, you you really don't, you don't have that problem at, you know, at the smaller venues. So, yeah. I mean, I, I feel like as a fan, it is just more, um, like I said, more personal, you, you know, you, it's more intimate and that's, what's really cool about it. Right. You know, and then I, I hear what you're saying. And I, I think it's great to play the big festivals and we've done a lot of big ones in our time, but I enjoy playing the smaller festivals and I enjoy playing, uh, like the smaller clubs where you can go in and it's lit and people are right up against you. I mean, they're right up against that stage. And, uh, and one of the things they do in Britain, and I don't know when they started this, but as they, uh, because the weather's so bad, you know, there's only a certain time that you can really have outside kind of festivals and unless it's just pissing down with rain. Right. But what they do is uh, they take theatres, like big theatres, Mm -hmm. Or else some of the big civic centers where, I mean, it ranges in size, just depends what kind of festival that they're putting on. But you can get like a 10,000 seat arena and they hold a, a three day festival in there. Right. Inside. And then they get smaller ones, uh, which is really cool. And uh, and that's, that's pretty cool because that's a lot more intimate. And then you can do a lot of meet and greets and have a lot of fun. And so I like a lot of the smaller ones that we do. And, uh, but, I really do enjoy some of the bigger ones when you go play. There's nothing like getting out there and playing in front of like 60,000 people and they're all going crazy, you know, and then oh, uh, you come off and it's like, you know, you've just, you've just left it all on stage and then it's time to have a few cold beers. So it's, it's, yeah. And I, I enjoy that, but that some of all those places in Europe are kind of few and far between unless you hit them at the right time in the summer, like Sweden rock, whacking uh, Barcelona, uh, obviously, uh, well, it's not. It's called Download now. It used to be called Donington, and uh, way back in time, then the Reading Festival and all that kind of stuff. And so, there's a, there's there's still a lot of big cool festivals in Europe to play. Oh yeah. So just one last question, man, and and this is one that I I ask quite a bit, and it's it, to me it's enjoyable to hear the different answers. Uh huh. Yeah. What was it that got you into music? What was it that just made you say, this is what I want to do for a living, what I want to do for the rest of my life? I would say watching uh, as a kid, and when I say as a kid, I'd say, because my, my my brother used to play music all the time when I was growing up. He was, there's a, there's a, a like a six year, six year age gap between him and me. So, uh, so he would, so he was getting into music as I was a kid growing up, but I was always in the house. So he was always constantly playing music and it was different because he would play a lot of Motown and a lot of other stuff in the Beatles and the Stones and all this kind of stuff through his sixties and then the seventies. Then I get into my own kind of music growing up as a kid, but what really watching when I was old enough to, to watch stuff on TV, like talk of the pops is we used to get that all the time. That was a British show. That used to be on every every Thursday, and uh, then there'd be some other little shows that you'd see during the week. But watching some of the bands on that, like Sweet, uh, Mott the Hoople, uh, Slade, you know, watching watching stuff like that, Rod Stewart and the Faces, and all this kind of stuff, and and you'd see the band, and you'd see like how much fun they were having and how cool it was, and I was like, shit, I want to do that. You know what I mean? I was so that, that was that that was it. And then obviously, when what when that happened, then I get into my own music. Then I was in it Free, Bad Company, Led Zeppelin, ACDC. You know what I mean? And I was never into Black Sabbath, but I, I preferred Aussie solo stuff. But uh, Priest, so UFO kind of thing, you know. So then obviously, the more you were getting into all that, it was like, man, I want to play in a band. Let's put a band together. And so I would look for people that were into that kind of thing. But that's really what it was. I think it was watching TV, TV as a kid and seeing musicians 
and going, and me just really sitting there going, shit, I want to do that. That was it. You know? Hey, I, man, I, I I said the same thing, only um, I lack the, uh, I guess, the commitment and the talent to to do it. But, yeah, <laughs> I used to... I used to watch the same thing. Like, like I said, man, my, you know, I was more early nineties, the, the days of poison and all them. And you, know, you see them guys up there, you know, having fun on stage, uh, you know, the videos and stuff. And it was like, God, that'd be so awesome. You know, but then yeah. you, you also hear like some of the, you watch these behind the musics on them or whatever. And you hear some of these horror stories. It's like, Whoa, you know, you never really, thought of that <laughs> side of it it was more of just the the party and the having fun traveling the world the women the booze yeah yeah that's a lot i mean all that stuff's great and all that happens and stuff but when you see all the behind the story stuff as I, I can imagine it is quite shocking to people who are fans of those bands and they, they go shit man i thought those dudes i thought those dudes were all friends mm-hmm. you know you find out they all hated each other and it was you know there was always something going on and but I think that happens with every band after a period of time. That was the same way us when we, I mean, we were all best of friends for like, shit, 10 years, something like that. And then at the end, when we first all split up, it was like, we all hated each other, yeah. you know, because we spent so much time in that period of being with each other 24-7 mm-hmm. and being drunk together, being this mm-hmm. and being that and being out of control. and. So eventually it just took its toll where everybody just, nah, I don't want to be around these guys anymore, man. I need, I need to go and do something else. And uh, But I, that, that happens with all bands, you know, which is kind of sad. But at least for that period of time, they're all, when, when they are happy, you know, it's great. Oh, I bet. You know, it's, it's awesome. And it's great to be a fan to see all that. It's just... But I, I, I can't imagine any band not being with that in some shape or form, you know, where they, there was a lot of kind of disliking and each other. They all loved each other, then hated each other, then loved each other, you know, I'm sure. Uh, I just like like, family. Yeah, it's just like a family. That's what it is. Because you're with everybody. Hell, during the, the whole 80s, I was, I was with Gary Gordon, Punky, and Brian more than I was with anybody else in my life, you know? Just yeah. like, because that's all we did. All we did was sleep, eat, and breathe rock music. We'd go play. We'd finish one tour, do another album, and go back out again. Finish one tour, do go back. So it was constant. So, yeah, I mean, that's why it had to be, too, I guess, you know, to, to stay relevant and make the money. Yeah. Yeah. And keep everything going because you travel the world and play. Right. And, uh, so, but it was, it was great. It was, it was a great period. You know, and 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 it's great now. You know, the the band's great, and we're all everybody's enjoying it. And you know, we'll just see we'll see where it takes us, what's going to happen. So I'm looking forward to the new album coming out, so everybody can actually hear a brand new album, and we're not just one of these bands that that's out there just playing all the old songs, right? You know, even though they sound great, and we I mean we kick ass when we play live. I'm looking forward to the new stuff coming out, and so everybody can sit back and just go. Damn man, fuck that, that. They really are good, you know. Yeah. So I'm excited. I'm excited. I can't wait for you to hear it. So I I'll make sure you hear it either. I'll make sure you. I'll make sure they, Sean and them send you a copy and everything, so you can check it out. Awesome man, I appreciate that. So no, just my pleasure, recap, man. you got the 40 year anniversary the, coming out. Yeah, we get the 40th year anniversary of the first album, which was Letting Loose. Yeah. And then after that. Uh, in the fall, we'll release the new album, and okay. we don't have a title for that yet, so we keep on discussing that at the moment. But uh, I just need to finish out. I've, I've sang some of the songs, uh, we've finished basically all the songs in demo form, so they'll the guys will get the rest of the music done and recorded. Then I'll fly over and I'll sing the whole album and mix it together and mix it in like April, and so April, May be time we finish mixing it, and then uh. I'll come back to the States because uh, the rest of the guys all live in Europe. And then uh, that will be that will come out in the fall. But then I'll go back over the beginning of August for rehearsals. And then the first show, like I said, is in Munich on uh, the 26th of August. So Awesome. Yeah, looking forward to that. Well, I will look forward to the new music, man. Um, 
you guys best of luck to you. Uh, be safe out there in your travels. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. And Thank then you. once we get it out, we'll come back on. We'll get back together and we'll sit and talk about the album. Hell yeah. Sounds like a great plan, buddy. Okay, I'm in. All right, man. Thanks a lot. Take it light, brother. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.